Hello and welcome. My name is Roberta Watson and on behalf of Jefferson's Alumni Office, I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar all about seasonal allergies. We have postgraduate alumna Dr. Shirley Fung here to share her expertise with us. Uh, but before we pass it over to Dr. Fung, I want to share just some general housekeeping and timing things. So, you know, we will have um, Dr. Fung present some information. And then after her presentation, we'll move into an audience Q&A. So feel free to submit your questions throughout today's talk using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see that, try moving your mouse and it should appear. Now to get us started, I would like to give a quick introduction to Dr. Fung. She completed her internal medicine residency here at Jefferson in 2002 before going on to complete additional training at Drexel in infectious diseases and then Albert Einstein Medical College in allergy and immunology. She's since returned to Philadelphia and is raising her family here. And we're so happy to have her back here at Jefferson as one of our assistant professors in the Sydney Kimmel Medical College. So with that quick intro, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Fung. Dr. Fung, thank you so much for joining us. So excited to have you here today. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much for having me. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or morning if you're on a different time zone. Um, so um, we're going to talk about um, seasonal allergies today. Um, yeah. So uh, seasonal allergies and um, our next, um, you move on to the next slide. Okay, um, so this year it's been a particularly bad spring seasonal allergy season. Um, and I don't know, it may have something to do with uh, us having, uh, experiencing COVID, um, uh, precautions in the past two years uh, where uh, la uh, the past two springs you've been more indoors and wearing masks even when outdoors um, but uh, we've been in our allergy office uh, in our allergy clinic we've been um, handling many more phone calls than what we normally um, handle this spring than in the past two years um, but uh, hopefully um, after this um, little informal talk on allergies, we can give you appropriate advice um, and um, options uh, so you can um, feel better this season. Um, it's interesting that uh, we're, uh, it's nice that we're, we chose May as the month um, to do this talk. Um, May, and it's, um, also interesting to know that May um, happens to be the, um, the month that uh, Asthma and Allergy Foundation has declared um, as National Asthma and Allergy Awareness Month. Um, and for a good reason. Um, it's a peak season for people with asthma and allergies and it's, it's a perfect time to educate patients, family, friends, coworkers, and others about these diseases. Um, and you can always um, uh, look up these this information at the Asthma Allergy Foundation and the websites on this this slide. Um, so hopefully after this talk, you'll be better prepared for allergy season, as in this cartoon. Um, allergic rhinitis has a huge burden. Um, it affects ten to thirty percent of adults and up to forty percent of children, and the worldwide prevalence is increasing. It's uh, definitely has an impact on the quality of life, um, can cause morbidity, reduce work, work productivity, and cause um, lost school days. Um, overall, there's a high cost to individuals and society, over, se over $7 billion directly, and over $4 billion in indirect costs to the United States. And the comorbidities um, associated with allergic rhinitis include asthma, um, atopic dermatitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, with or without polyps, um, sleep apnea, and even um, gastroesophageal reflux disease or heartburn. So I hope everyone, all the moms out there had a wonderful Mother's Day. Um, and I happen to be a mom of four young kids. Um, and I found this little cartoon um, and it, 
actually um, covers a lot of the symptoms with seasonal allergies. So some, uh, seasonal allergy symptoms include itching in the nose, the roof of the mouth, throat or eyes, sneezing, stuffy nose or congestion, runny nose, tearing eyes, dark circle and under the eyes. It can also cause rashes, including hives or atopic dermatitis or eczema. Um, and, um, and these can, you know, moms can relate, I, I suppose, with even the dark circles and the trouble sleeping. Uh, but um, hopefully uh, we can help with this after the talk. Um, so as allergists, we look at many, many people's noses. And when we typically look at a normal looking nose on the right, um, it's not swollen, but still pink and, 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 and um, not inflamed looking. So when we look in allergic noses uh, with a little rhinoscope, uh, we can tell that they're that it's still pink and boggy and really puffy. And this is a, a, cl a clear sign to us that this patient's um, nasal congestion and runny nose is from allergies and not from um, something like a uh, viral infection. So one question that always comes up is I'm having nasal congestion, runny nose. Um, could this be my allergies or could it be an infection like for example, COVID infection or the common cold? So this is a great um, uh, chart that I found um, from the American Academy of a a a Allergy, Asthma and Immunology. Um, and this is also, um, the Academy is a great resource for um, a lot of al allergy questions or asthma questions. Um, so just to make a, make a point, it, with allergies, you don't typically have the fevers and the muscle aches or a really bad sore throat or the stomach symptoms. Um, you could still have like the nasal congestion, sometimes even a loss of smell, but it's just usually temporary. Um, and then the runny nose is still common in, in both viral infections and allergies. Itchy eyes is common, but not as common in viral infections. Um, and sneezing is common more in um, uh, allergies than in viral infections. Um, so you, when, if you experience chills and a really bad headache, um, with, along with fevers, um, respiratory symptoms like cough and shortness of breath, um, please seek your provider um, and um, obtain the COVID test, okay? And if it's negative, more likely it could be one of the other viruses which are common in this season as well. We still are seeing a lot of flu cases as late as April. Um, and uh, certainly we are seeing a lot of common cold cases. Um, generally, um, a question is like, does, what about sore throat? Well, usually sore throat and allergies are, is very mild. It doesn't, it's not like the razor blade like feeling you get with like acute pharyngitis a viral pharyngitis. Um, so just keep in mind that um, generally in with allergies, we don't have the, the, the fevers, headache, um, sore throat and muscle aches. And, and also, if you're not sure, sometimes it helps to, for a, a provider to actually look inside the nose. Um, again, like a allergy provider can recognize a allergic looking nose and uh, differentiate from a viral infection looking nose where the viral infection can cause more redness inflamed mucosa tissue. Um, so next I want to talk about climate change and its impact on allergies and um, climate change can affect the production of protein composition of pollen and fungal spores and um, also like affect the dispersion, transportation and deposition of, of, of this and this can be associated with changing rainfall and winds and other related meteorological factors. Um, climate um, changes can impact pollen seasons of trees and grasses, weeds, by increasing the amount of pollen produced and by extending the duration of the pollen season. Next, we have this map of um, the pollen seasons and it can vary regionally based on the Northern um, United States. Um, and then there's, it's different in the Southeastern United States and also the, um, the, 
the, the western parts of the states. But in general, um, tree pollen season for the northeast, where in Philadelphia, where we're at, is generally from February to June. And sometimes we're seeing um, a more prolonged or longer um, tree pollen season, mainly due to um, like um, milder winters. Um, and so pollen season might start as early as late January in some parts of Pennsylvania um, and extend even to past um, June or July um, due to um, warmer and more productive um, climates for um, pollen dispersion. Uh, when you look at grass season, um, this can also um, be from um, May to August in the Pennsylvania area. Um, and this may be extended due to um, uh, climate change. So just remember um, that tree pollen season is in early spring. Grass pollen season is in late spring and early summer. And in the Philadelphia area, I kind of remind my patients that around Memorial Day is when um, grass season gets um, uh, very noticeable and peaks. Um, and the Weed pollen, which includes um, uh, uh, pigweed, English plantain, nettle, um, those are in the summer and fall. Um, ragweed is another pollen, it's a major pollen, especially in the late summer and fall and affects um, most of the United States. However, in certain parts of the United States like Florida, it's even a longer season from July to November. Um, so just remember in warmer places, wherever you are, pollination can be year round. Um, and just re remember that powdery pollen is easily spread by wind, not bees or insects. So um, one question that uh, I, my patients ask me, can um, I've, they've heard that um, uh, unpasteurized local honey can help with their pollen allergies, but I kind of discourage that, um, and that's a myth, um, because pollinating bees really pollinate flowers um, and, and low-lying plants. They're not pollinating trees or, or grasses, which um, those pollens are really dispersed by wind. So it's very unlikely that the local, local um, honey can be a, um, a effective therapy for um, seasonal pollen allergies. Um, this is a, a funny slide uh, because uh, the, the little kids are making fun of their dad and they're calling him allergy man for Halloween and they're wishing for um, a hard freeze. Um, so most likely he's based on this just guessing that he's probably allergic to ragweed, which is uh, one of the, the major pollens in, um, in the fall. Uh, usually around Labor Day is when um, a lot of my symptomatic patients actually call our office and, um, and we try to help them um, get over their um, severe symptoms. Um, so usually the ragweed season um, um, ends with the first frost in autumn, and that's usually in late October, or early November. Um, but then once that season is over, you also have to realize people can be allergic to mold and there's a mold season and molds can be anywhere, including soil, plants and rotting wood. Um, they float in the air just like pollen. Um, mold spores um, begin to increase as temperatures rise in the spring. Um, the United States mold spores reach their peak in July in warmer states and October in colder states. And year round in the South and in the West Coast, um, the mold is, can be pretty prevalent. So um, I have to mention that the there's a National Allergy Bureau. Um, this is a, the only um, pollen and mold counting network that is certified the, by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Um, the National Allergy Bureau compiles pollen and mold levels from certified stations across the nation. And you can count, um, find your counts at, um, at the Quad AI um, website. Um, 
And hay fever or symptoms can be less prominent on rainy, cloudy, or windless days because there's less dispersal of pollen with, during these conditions. Um, pollen also tends to travel more with hot, dry, and windy weather, which can increase your allergy symptoms. So just remember that those windy, beautiful days where you wanna just open up the windows and get some fresh air, not a great idea if you're pollen allergic because you're just letting all that pollen into your home and um, breathing it in, um, becoming symptomatic. And then um, it'll be much harder to get you back to baseline if um, you're constantly being exposed to the pollen. So um, this is a great cartoon. I'm sure everyone has stepped outside and looked at their car or windows and they see that, that kind of like that light green film of dust on their car or window. All of that is pollen. It's very sticky. It sticks to your car, your windows, the shrubs. It's um, on the grass when your pet rolls around in it. Um, so we we kind of advise some simple steps just to reduce your exposures. Try to keep your windows closed. Uh, and if possible, the air conditioner running just to keep the air clean, cool, and dry. Um, also try to stay indoors when the pollen or, or mold counts are high. And I'll talk more about how do you check pollen counts or track pollen counts. And I'll give you some resources for that. Um, and when you're in the car, um, just remember, keep your windows closed when you're driving. I know it's tempting It's if it's a beautiful day to have the convertible top off and just, you know, taking in the breeze. But if that if you're truly um, pollen allergic, that's not a good idea. So um, this cartoon kind of um, goes the, to the extreme of what else you can do for pollen allergies. Um, so after prolonged outdoor activities like jogging or hiking or just a simple um, walking your dog, um, after those activities, if take a shower, shampoo your hair or change your clothes after you come back indoors. Um, if you can't always do that, and we also, we understand everyone has a busy life, um, they can't live in a spacesuit or in a, bu in a um, bubble. Um, you can try just to routinely shower and shampoo before bedtime, even having your spouse um, doing the same. Um, and that removes the pollen. I tell my patients that pollen is very sticky. It sticks to your hair, your clothes, even your eyelashes and, and your skin. And you don't want to bring it into your home environment and constantly have that exposure that you're still inhaling some of the pollen, rubbing it against your eyes. Um, and, um, it, and I just had a patient today who, um, who was a hairdresser and she had told me that it's impossible for her to wash her, her hair every day. So we suggested that, um, that at night before going to bed, um, put at least um, either a, um, a head cap on, okay, just to keep her hair covered. Uh, she can also change her pillowcase every night before going to bed. Um, so that that's those are other options. Um, also wearing a hat when you're outdoors actually covers your hair so that the pollen doesn't land on your hair. Um, so these are little tips I offer to my patients. Um, I tell them to avoid um, a lot of outdoor, other outdoor activities like mowing the lawn or raking leaves. Um, this stirs up a lot of pollen and mold and, um, and increases your exposures. If you're pro, if you um, hang dry your clothes, we kind of discourage that. Um, also with bed sheets, if you hang dry your bed sheets, we discourage that because that's all bringing pollen back into your home or sleeping environment. Um, some other steps you can um, implement. Um, uh, if you have eczema or atopic dermatitis, and this is usually a seasonal um, allergy um, because it can um, be exacerbated, but when more allergens or pollen 
contact your skin. So we try to counsel our patients to keep these eczema prone areas, usually they're the elbows or the neck area or the chest area, even the eyes can have eczema. Um, keep these eczema prone areas covered when outdoors. So if you have eye eczema, um, wear shades or eye sunglasses when you're outdoors, okay? That actually shields your eyes from from the wind when the wind is carrying all that pollen hitting your face. Um, I also met, previously mentioned wearing a hat or head covering keeps pollen off your hair. Um, and we realized this, you know, the past two years during the pandemic that wearing a mask outdoors, a, a um, good filtering mask is actually very good at uh, keeping pollen from being inhaled through your nose or your mouth. And this uh, cartoon is um, kind of reminisces on on that point. Uh, don't we? Don't you wish we have? Don't you wish we didn't have to wear masks anymore? Are you kidding me? It's allergy season, so I'm encouraging my patients. Even though a lot of um, uh, municipalities are removing mask mandates, um, it's okay to wear your mask if you have allergies. All right. Um, I think you will thank yourself for that. <laughs> Uh, so how do we check pollen counts? Um, so there are many resources. I just um, picked up a, like a three examples. Um, we mentioned the National Allergy Bureau. Um, that's, a spot, that's sponsored by the uh, Asthma Allergy and, um, uh, Immunology Organization. Um, it tells you uh, based on your zip code, whether um, tree pollens are high, weed pollen or grass or molds are in your area. Um, there are other um, websites, pollen.com is a popular one, and it is um, available um, online or as a smartphone app. And, and based on your zip code you plug in um, or, or wherever your zip code you travel to, um, you can get your pollen counts. And I like it because it also gives you a five-day forecast. And this is the five-day forecast for Philadelphia. So uh, on Sunday, it's gonna be on the high side um, and as well as Monday, but then a little bit lower on Tuesday and Wednesday. But I generally tell my patients, if you see in, in the medium or high side, those are days you should try to stay indoors if possible. Do all the precautions we had talked about, like keeping your windows closed um, and uh, um, wearing your eye, sh eye protection and perhaps even wearing your mask. Um, and typically on those really rainy days are usually the safer days to, to spend um, time outdoors and not suffer from the pollen allergies. Um, this is a new app that I just found, and this is um, a smartphone app, uh, My Pollen Forecast, and it also tells you what type of tree pollens are high. So this uh, week it's been oak, birch, and maple. Um, Oak pollen, when you see that as being very high, um, that, that no, oak is notorious in causing a lot of eye symptoms, eye itching, eye redness, eye tearing. Um, so just be extra cautious when you see oak pollen high. Um, birch pollen is, uh, is very abundant in the Northeast as well. Um, Classically, it causes typically the, the, the runny nose, water itchy eyes, and the nasal congestion, sneezing. Same as maple. Um, and it also forecasts the pollen um, counts for the next days. And um, there are many other resources, even like weather, weather um, uh, apps have um, pollen um, tracking um, or pollen counts as well. So what can you do besides the precautions I mentioned? Um, so there are a lot of over-the-counter um, medication options. Um, we can start by talking about antihistamines. Um, I'll refer to the brand names, but just remember I have no proprietary interest or stocks in any of these um, brands. Um, but uh, Claritin is a very popular uh, second generation antihistamine. Um, the main difference between second generation antihistamines and a first generation antihistamines like Benadryl is that they're less sedating and they have a longer duration of action. So Benadryl usually wears 
wears off after about four to four to six hours and can be make, can make you very sleepy. Same with um, um, another old school antihistamine cord, Tramiton, um, can make you drowsy. And, and um, so when our first line agents are a second generation antihistamine, so they, they won't make you as drowsy. They work for 24 hours um, and um, they're quite effective. Um, and Claritin's um, is one of the most popular, it's the least expensive. Um, then there's Allegra, Allegra typically does not cause drowsiness um, and it works for 24 hours. Um, there, the 160 milligram dose, 180 milligram dose, I'm sorry, is the 24 hour version. The, the, the 12 hour version is 60 milligram dose. Um, there's also Zyrtec, which is um, another popular agent, especially with children. Um, this um, is, is quite effective. It uh, also works for 24 hours. Um, adult dose is 10 milligrams um, and children's um, dosing is five milligrams. Um, it also comes in um, chewable tablets and uh, in a suspension versions for children. Um, and then um, um, there's a newer generation of over-the-counter antihistamine, um, and that's Zyzo. It's actually a third generation. I'm sorry, I had to correct that. That's uh, a third generation um, antihistamine. And the advantage over to a second generation is that it has a, even a longer duration of, of action and is um, a little bit more potent than the um, than the second generation antihistamines. So it's a the downside is that it's a lot more expensive. Um, and, um, it, but I, I, I have a lot of my patients who've already tried the second gener generation Claritin, Allegra, and Zyrtec and not getting relief. I actually had them try the Zizel instead. So if you're already, if you're out there and still not feeling better on a, on the daily Claritin or a daily Allegra or a daily Zyrtec, I'm, um, going to advise you, you know, the next step we'll probably try a third generation antihistamine like Zizel, which is over the counter. So um, a the next um, group of medications over the counter for allergies are intranasal steroids or nose sprays. Um, these include the popular brands Flonase um, and oops, what did I do? Um, Flonase and um, and Sensimist, okay. Um, Flomace is, is, works very well, but some patients don't tolerate um, that it, it can over dry their nose and, um, and sometimes it burns because it's al alcohol based. Um, so I had them try um, either the Flonase Sensimist or the Nasocort and Rhinocort if they have um, nose problems with nosebleeds or um, burning when they use a nose, when they use a regular Flonase. So Sensimist has, is basically the same drug, fluticasone, um, that's in Flonase, but in a different dispenser and it's, um, uh, more, it's water-based instead of alcohol-based. Um, and the dispenser is a little fancy and it's, uh, it makes it a, a finer mist. So it kind of, this mist gets into the finer nooks and crannies of your nose that um, this kind of squirt spray um, can't get into. Um, uh, the, uh, the only downside is that the sensor mist is a lot more expensive than the, the Flonase. Um, nasal cord is another option as well, very similar to, um, to the Flonase and um, the Rhinocort, but uh, it's uh, water-based. And the Rhinocort is also water-based. Um, they're all very similar. And again, it's not one size fits all. I just have my patients try different ones if they were not having success with ones or having side effects from the other until they find the right fit um, or one that they can um, that that they feel is working and without causing too many side effects. Um, there are other nasal therapies um, that are over the counter. One is called um, nasal chrome, um, and that uh, is basically intranasal chromalin. Um, I've used this myself. Um, I don't really find that it works as well as the intranasal steroids, and you would have to use the nasal chrome like about four times a day um, for it to have any effect, any uh, positive effect. Um, other, 
I've uh, discouraged use of Afrin or uh, oxymetazolone. It's basically a vasoconstrictor. It's not recommended because um, uh, patients who who use it get the rebound effect. So they actually get feel more constricted and congested uh, when the Afrin wears off after um, four to five hours. So they call it the rebound effect. So the patients actually who are use Afrin too frequently can actually feel worse. Um, one thing that I like to um, advise my patients to try are neti pot or saline rinses. Um, and this is more of a homeopathic remedy for al seasonal allergies or year-round allergies. Uh, it's basically just a salt water solution. Um, this, it, it provides salt packets. You use distilled water or previously boiled water, and you mix it in the salt packet into a solution. And then you can just kind of rinse out or lavage your nasal passages with it. And it's hard to picture it if you've never done it before. Um, there are also YouTube videos on how on um, demonstrating how to do these lavages. Um, but I tell my patients, just try it. If you don't like it, you don't have to keep doing it, but it does take some practice. Um, and sometimes you just have to it, you get used to it after a few tries, um, but it does provide a, um, relief in terms of uh, like rinsing out the allergens and the mucus that um, the allergies do, pro do produce. So if you have a post-nasal drip, um, it's, it's really helpful for that as well. So a lot of these um, antihistamines, intranasal steroids are, are available over the counter, also in generic or store brand um, form. So you don't always have to buy the brand names and you can buy the store brand equivalent. Um, which is much less expensive. Um, okay, um, so going over um, medication therapy, um, some other over-the-counter options include many choices of eye drops. Um, my over-the-counter um, preferred eye drops are Alloa um, or Zatador, which is Still, that both the same um, drug in it, but just different manufacturers and different packaging. Um, and then there's Pataday, which used to be prescription, but is now over the counter. This is a little bit more expensive, but it is a once a day um, antihistamine eye drop. Um, the um, the other options, if you go to the allergy eye shelf, uh, out the eye shelf, um, eye medicine shelf on the at the nearest CVS or Walgreens or or drugstore, um, this time of year it's it's a little bit sparse, and all your lists you see that they've run out of the Alloway and the Paddy and the Zadar. All you see are the Visines, Nafcons, and Opcon A, um, and and these I I don't necessarily um, encourage patients to use. It's kind of like the Afrin. These all contain a vasoconstrictor called nafazolin. And with these vasoconstrictor, you get the rebound effect as well. So when it wears off, your eyes get really red um, and, and um, maybe you feel worse. The Phenyramine is the antihistamine component. Um, and still, it's pretty short acting. You only have a relief for about four to six hours before you start having symptoms again. Um, so that's why I prefer the twice a day Alloway or the Zadador and the, or the once a day Pat a day if you want over the counter eye drop relief. Um, in terms of decongestants, oral, decong oral decongestants, um, the popular Sudafed or Sudafedrin um, or phenylephrine um, is available over the counter, uh, but always remember that has each of these have potential stimulant effects, such as increase in heart rate or palpitations, uh, increase in blood pressure is also a possibility that needs to be monitored. So we don't recommend these on a daily basis. Um, many patients who are reliant on decongestants like Sudafed or they'll buy the um, Claritin D uh, um, or the Allegra D or the Zyrtec D because they feel like the Sudafed is what makes a difference. I actually suggest that they should um, try to come off the pseudoephedrine and add the intranasal steroid instead. Okay, the intranasal steroid is is 
better at um, treating the nasal congestion, okay, in the long term than at oral decongestant in general, uh, mainly because intranasal steroids are are working towards um, um, the delayed response allergic response, okay, which is the, the nasal congestion. Um, so that uh, I try to tell patients, it's okay to take an antihistamine plus the intranasal steroid at the same time. A lot of patients, they're, they're quite weary that they think that they can only take one medicine at a time, either antihistamines alone or nasal steroids alone for their allergies and are not getting complete relief. And um, I tell them it's okay to combine an antihistamine plus an intranasal steroid, you'll get better relief of your symptoms. And you can add, actually add the eye drops as needed. Um, so if you're having experiencing pretty severe um, refractory um, nasal congestion, um, then, definitely add on the intranasal steroid. Also, I want to mention that intranasal steroids work better if they're used on a daily basis during the allergy season rather than a couple times a week or as needed. Um, again, it, it works um, in suppressing the delayed allergic response in the nose. So there are prescription options as well. Um, so there are many oral antihistamines that we're gonna talk about. Also there's nasal sprays, there are different types of nasal, nasal sprays, there's steroidal, and then there's antihistamine nasal sprays. Um, there's also a different category of oral medication called oral antileukotrienes. Uh, and then there are, are um, prescribed eye drops that we could, we're gonna talk about. Um, so the prescription options. So we talked about oral um, antagonists or um, an antihistamines and leukotriene. So for prescription wise, there's um, a th the third generation antihistamines. There's um, desloratadine, also the brand name would be Clarinex. And then, as I mentioned before, there's Zyzo. The generic name is levocetirizine. But, and fortunately, Zyzo is now over the counter. Um, it was not over the counter um, six or seven years ago. Um, so, um, so these can be prescribed, um, uh, especially if you have already failed the, the over-the-counter, um, therapies, um, as a prescription, uh, we, um, allergists also like to add on, um, Montelukast, the brand name is Singular, um, and this is usually a tablet uh, taking at night. It also is indicated for um, not just seasonal allergies, but also mild asthma. Um, but please do keep in mind there is a black box warning that it can um, um, cause some mood or sleep disturbances in some patients. Um, um, the older version of Montelukast is Zafirlukast, also known as Accolade. This is a twice a day pill. Um, many patients who can't tolerate Montelukast due to its side effects, I can, um, uh, I've tried them on the Zafirlukast. Um, there are many prescription nose sprays. Um, those include the steroidal type, and those are um, Nasonex, Omneris, um, q and Zetona. Um, these are, um, Nasonex is kind of similar to the over-the-counter Nasoport and um, Rhinocort and Flonase. Um, and it's a, a water-based nose spray, very little side effects. Um, and then Omneris and Q-Nasal Zetonia are a little bit stronger um, nose spray is still steroidal. Um, the Q nasal and Zetona have are aerosolized. They use the same similar propellant that's in um, asthma inhalers to disperse the, the drug into the nasal passages. So um, this gets better dispersal. Um, only um, obstacle we usually run is that uh, many insurances will not cover these stronger or better dispersing nose sprays unless they failed um, the over-the-counter nose sprays. Um, and then there's the antihistamine type of nose spray. Um, those include azelastine, olipatidine, um, and these actually work if you're main complaint is post nasal drip and um and rhinorrhea discharge from your nose it actually it has these have a really strong anticholinergic effect and helps dry up the nose um as well um unfortunately um it has some 
some side effects. It can cause it has um, some some potential to cause light some slight sedation. Um, also, if it ends up um, being inhaled and ends up in the throat, it has a really bitter taste that many patients do not like. Um, and um, it can sometimes over dry the nose um, and cause nosebleeds. Um, one of the newer agents um, is a combined nose spray of a steroidal and an antihistamine, and that's called Dimista. Um, it, um, in my experience, it's worked very well in um, reducing allergy symptoms, in the, especially in the nasal patches, because it's um, combined, combining um, and working against the nasal congestion and the rhinitis. So we've talked about um, we've talked about um, the, the the prescription options for um, controlling your allergy symptoms, um, and at some point there's a, there's a need to see an allergist. Um, definitely, if you've tried all the over-the-counter medicines, including the, the intranasal steroid, and even the, the second or third generation antihistamine, um, then you should definitely, you know, make a um, consultation with the allergist. Um, and they can perhaps um, guide you in terms of any prescription options, um, such as um, the, the anti intranasal antihistamine or, um, or Singular or our anti-leukotriene um, uh, modifiers. So um, there's also a lot of um, uh, eye drop options um, that are available as prescription as well. Um, and definitely if you have the other comorbidities such as as poorly controlled asthma or chronic sinusitis or recurrent sinusitis, even skin issues like eczema um, or atopic dermatitis, and it's related to seasonal or environmental allergies in general, um, then that, those are reasons to see an allergist. Uh, what can we offer? Um, we can offer allergy testing. Um, allergy testing, we do skin prick testing and um, intradermal testing to uh, various pollens, trees, weeds, and grasses. We also do indoor allergy, allergy tests to um, pets like cats and dogs, um, other animals. Um, uh, indoor allergens like, like dust mites and, and other um, indoor and outdoor allergens like molds as well. Um, you just have to remember uh, with allergy testing, we, you have to be off your antihistamines for at least five to seven days to get accurate results. Um, and, um, and if you're unable to get allergy testing because you're on medications that would interfere with testing, other ways we can get allergy test for allergies by um, blood work. And that's called a radioallergosorbent test or a RAST. Um, these are um, blood tests that looks at specific IgE to certain um, antigen. Um, however, however, it can be expensive. And, um, but there are many cases where we order it if uh, we can't skin test a patient because they're pregnant or they uh, can't stop their antihistamines for other reasons, or they're on, um, uh, and tricyclic antidepressants or, um, or other agents that can suppress skin testing. Um, the on, only unfortunate thing about this, these um, blood tests for allergies is it's not always covered by Medicare plans. And this can vary by region as well. Um, and, and a main reason for a referral to allergists would be if um, you hear or learn to, learn to learn more about allergy shots or immunotherapy. And we'll talk more about that. So um, there's different types of allergy immunotherapy um, to treat seasonal allergies or uh, year-round allergies. Um, those include subcutaneous immunotherapy or, or what we call allergy shots. And then there's sublingual immunotherapy, um, which um, has some advantages and disadvantages. We're going to talk more about that. So what are the pros and cons of subcutaneous immunotherapy? Um, so some of the pros, it alters the immune response. It builds immune tolerance. Um, it does provide, it's more of a long-term solution to 
treating your allergy symptoms. Because when I tell, counsel my patients, I tell them that all those over-the-counter and prescription medications, all they do is suppress allergy symptoms um, or provide you temporary relief of your allergy symptoms. Uh, but you're still allergic to those allergens, okay? You're going to still need to take these medications, some only just seasonally, some people have to take it year round. So those looking for long-term relief where they don't want to have to rely on so much medications for their allergy symptoms, they, they, they would be a candidate for immunotherapy. Um, and about 85% of patients do experience improvement in their symptoms at, um, with immunotherapy. Um, the best evidence or is of efficacies is, is in cat immunotherapy. Uh, and it's almost always covered by insurances. Um, the cons, um, it, it's, it's a huge commitment. It's time consuming to start allergy shots. It's weekly for at least six months. Uh, every practice does their, um, their allergy shot um, schedule differently, but uh, we do weekly for at least um, uh, six to eight months um, in our um, Jefferson practice. Um, it takes at least six months to feel symptom improvement. Um, and the main biggie um, against um, allergy shots is that there's a risk of anaphylaxis. Um, because if you imagine how we're um, modulating the immune response. We're actually injecting small and controlled doses of what you're allergic to, um, building that dose up, um, and eventually building that immune tolerance. Uh, for that reason, because we're actually giving you those doses of what you're allergic to, there is that risk of anaphylaxis. So the allergy shots cannot be administered at home. That's a big no-no. Um, and it has to be administered in some sort of medical setting, okay, preferred, preferably in our allergy office. Um, we can't start um, allergy shots during pregnancy. Um, usually wait till after um, delivery. Um, sometimes, um, um, Concomitant medications like beta blockers have to be held um, due to that risk of anaphylaxis. Um, there's a, at least a three to five year commitment and it's allergy shots because it's a shot, it's not for the needle phobic. Um, the other type of immunotherapy is the sublingual immunotherapy. Um, the advantage to that is that it can be self-administered in the dissolvable tablets. Um, a lot of um, allergy practices actually uh, compound their um, sublingual immunotherapy um, into droplets um, that are self-administered at home. Um, and there is less risk of anaphylaxis with sublingual immunotherapy, so that's why it can be administered at home. Uh, it has to be administered daily, though. Um, and it's just as efficacious as subcutaneous immunotherapy, as well as it's monoallergen therapy. It also alters the immune response and builds immune tolerance. And uh, currently it's FDA approved for grass pollen. These tablets are FDA approved for grass pollen, ragweed pollen, and dust mites. Um, unfortunately, it's not FDA approved for other allergens um, like tree pollen um, that would have to be compounded. And when it's compounded, it's not often covered by insurance and that can cost out of pocket about one to $2,000 a year. Um, there is still a risk for oral pharyngeal reactions like oral pruritus, um, um, uh, pharyngeal itching, um, and it's still a very, but it's still a very small risk of anaphylaxis. Um, it's if you're polyallergen there, uh, allergic, like for example, you're allergic to not just grass pollen, but you're also allergic to trees, weeds, grasses, cat, dog, mold, and dust mites, it's probably less efficacious. Um, and, um, and if you're just taking the sublingual tablets for um, like, for example, grass pollen, you have to start that like three months before the season starts. So if grass pollen starts in April um, that, or, or May, then you have to start these tablets as early as January. So I just want to, just before we, we're near our end, so I want to go over some take home points. Um, uh, differentiating hay fever um, from virus. Um, sometimes just remember that 
like with hay fever, springtime allergies, you don't have the, um, the sore throat, headache, um, muscle aches and fevers. Um, and uh, with virus infections, you do. Um, and just remember all the pollen exposure precautions, check your pollen counts, windows closed, shower before bedtime, wear your mask when you're outdoors um, and um, get that pollen off of you, okay? Um, every night before you go to bed. Um, there's also the, the trial over the counter options. Um, and then just remember when to see an allergist, you've tried everything, you're doing all the precautions and still having quite significant symptoms. Um, then we can offer testing, counseling and, and further management uh, and offer even um, uh, immunotherapy options. Um, and um, this is the end. I just wanna, this is a picture of me and my family. I have four little kiddos and um, I'll be actually attending the Jefferson, Jefferson alumni um, Phillies game on June 4th. Uh, hope to see you guys there. Um, and um, I always come prepared uh, because my, all my children have allergies. So I always have um, eye drops with me, inhalers with me, um, antihistamines with me. So uh, I always try to come prepared to um, any of these outdoor events, but I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Fung. This was so helpful. All of the different treatment options and um, over-the-counter versus prescription. I feel like you answered so many questions um, through your presentation, so thank you. Um, now we have just a few more minutes left of the webinar, um, and we already had a couple questions come through. So let me um, pose those to you. Um, one of our viewers, Audrey, um, was wondering, you know, if something like Zizol um, would provide relief or prevent eye eczema. Right, it, um, eye eczema would is harder to treat because um, it's more of a delayed type of reaction to the pollen. Um, the best thing to do with eye eczema is try to prevent it, okay? Re reduce your exposures. Um, and, um, uh, eye eczema can be caused by pollen allergies. And I tell my patients that, you know, try to wear your sunglasses, shield your eyes from the pollen. Um, they actually over the, sell over the counter eye wipes that you can use to kind of wipe off your eyelids and the pollen from your lids um, if you've been outside. Um, so that can be helpful. But uh, the, the Zyzo can really help more with the itching involved um, more than it, the, and the nasal reaction you're having. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Another question about um, treatment. Is there a difference between over-the-counter and prescription nasal spray dosage? The, the, the dosage for, um, for children is slightly different than in adults. In adults, it's generally two sprays of the of the intranasal steroid in each nostril once a day, or you can divide it up one spray each nostril twice a day. Uh, in children, it's just one spray each nostril once a day. Uh, so children younger than 12, I would say, is just um, the lower dose. Um, and um, just, this gives me a good opportunity to go over nasal spray technique. A lot of my patients don't realize that with the nasal spray, um, they don't, they don't, have to snort or inhale this nose spray because if you snort or inhale it, it just goes into the throat and not actually into the the the, the nooks and crannies of the nose. Um, so you just have to kind of squirt it in the nose and just a light little sniff, and that's enough. And whatever drips out, they just wipe with the tissue. Okay. Um, and also for to prevent nosebleeds, um, they actually should aim the nose spray a little bit outward. Like I tell my patients, like pretend you're your face is a clock and aim at 11 and one o'clock. Okay, when you spray your nose because your nasal septum is runs in the middle of your nose that has a tendency to bleed if it, you spray it towards the middle. Thank you for sharing the technique. That's helpful. Uh, so we've had a few questions submitted, you know, advance of the webinar and live. Um, so thank you for, for asking those. Um, but, you know, do allergies get worse as we age? What, what's your feeling on that? I think it, 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 it varies. Everyone is different. In general, uh, most of the population, um, it does improve um, as we age, mainly because as, as we get older into our senior years, um, our immune system is less, um, 
not as strong uh, and uh, so it doesn't react as strongly to these allergen exposures. Um, that's why even for vaccines, that's why there's high dose flu shots um, for our, 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 um, our senior adults um, and just because their immune system is not as uh, responsive. Terrific. Well, uh, that is all the time we have for the questions. So thank you to everybody for submitting those and, and participating. Um, just before we, we take off for the day, I'd like to share some upcoming events. Uh, we have several things online and in person over the next couple of months. Dr. Fung, thank you for, for mentioning Alumni Night at the Phillies. We're so excited for that on June 4th. Um, we are going to be at a few other ballparks around the nation, so we hope you'll be able to join us. And we have some really fun events coming up here in Philadelphia over the next few weeks. So if you have any questions, would like more information, or to register for any of these, please visit jefferson.edu forward slash alumni events. And if you'd like to continue you know, connecting with fellow Jefferson alumni, I hope that you will join us on the Jefferson Alumni Network and create your profile today. So that uh, covers it for today. Thank you again, Dr. Fung, for sharing all of this wonderful information. And, and thank you to each of you for joining us on your lunch hour. I hope you have a great day and I hope to see you all soon. Take care.